And as we remember that and we say, Jesus, I do love you because you care. Thank you, choir. Thank you, team, for that lead in because Jesus, because he cared because of his love, we now respond in love. He turns to us in 1 Corinthians and says, let me talk about the way of love that should <clears throat> describe all of those who follow me. We've been kind of going in tandem a little bit with what we're doing in Romans in our Thursday Bible study. And when we were talking about love and how we live with one another and even how we live with those who persecute us, our enemies. And because of that love that he has for us and he's demonstrated it, we now have an example. And just in case we start feeling that we are on the good side of this, he left Jesus as our example, not one another. Because when I start feeling I'm doing well and I look over and I compare myself to you and you're not, God's saying he's not the standard. She's not the standard. Jesus turns and says, I am the standard. And I love that because I don't care how great we feel, we are never going to surpass or even equal in our lifetime here on earth, Jesus Christ, the standard. And so we are always striving and forever growing and increasing in what he asks. And so when I hear that song this morning, Jesus, I love you. I love you because you loved me enough to care. But I'm going to add to that song. And then Jesus wants us to turn and say, saints, I love you because he cared, and now I can turn and love you. We want to talk this morning about the practice of love. Last week, we looked at the priority of love, and what we realized is if you are going to have the right practice, you must have the right priority. That works in so many other areas of our life, that if we are going to have the correct practice, there needs to be some priority set in place. If you are going to be in the practice of having A's in school, there better be a priority on putting those books before a lot of other things in your life. If you have as a practice or you want as a practice to excel on your job or to excel in a career, there needs to be a priority in place of preparing yourself to be the best you can be in that field of work or study. Wherever we want excellent practice, there needs to be right priorities for that practice. And so it is in the family of God, so it is in the faith, that if we are going to be people of godly, loving practice, we have to be people with a loving priority. And so we saw the benefits of that last week. But this week, we want to look at what love actually looks like. You know, you can say that what a good student looks like, and you have a certain set of descriptors, what a good husband looks like, what a good wife looks like, what a good friend, what a good sibling. We have, we have in our mind all these descriptors of what a good and you fill in the blank look like. Looks like. We do. We have them all. And yet we also have one for the faith. And it says, what does someone who lives a life of love, what do they look like? Or how do they look? Or what is it that love does? And what is love? Because we hear it a lot. We hear it used, abused, and overused in our world today. We have a lot of people calling what love is not love. And we have some that misunderstand love, that they would ask a question, what's love got to do with it? And God says, it's got everything to do with it. 
meaning your life. If you are a follower of Christ or if you want to live a life that is approved by God, love has to be at the foundation of who you are. I will go back again. I share this in Bible study. John 13, we read it last week. John 13, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, after he washed their feet, he says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples. He's getting ready to give them something that they can gauge their life against. And they would remember it later because John wasn't writing as he listened to Jesus at that moment. He's writing now after a life Filled, after a life filled with following God, and he is reflecting back. When he wrote the Gospel of John, he is reflecting back on this life that he lived with Christ. And he says, I remember when he said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And he was talking to that group that he had just finished washing their feet. Same group, by the way, that was arguing who was the greatest. Same group who was trying to size everyone up. Same group who two in the group, mother had come to him and said, hey, Lord, can my son sit on your right and your left? And the rest of the group got mad. I always wonder why did they get mad? Did they get mad because they didn't ask first? Or did they get mad because he was trying to promote himself above others? But Christ settled the score and said, your love will distinguish if you're with me or not. And what we do today is we put everything else up there as, as those things which tell or demonstrate that we follow Christ. Hey, I go to church. I even go to midweek Bible study. Hey, I come to Sunday school. I even go to youth Sunday school. And we fill in all the blanks with all the things that we think mark us as followers of Christ. We do. God, I read my Bible three or four times a week. Or maybe I read it every day. God, I get up and I pray before you. And all those things are inclusive in a life that's going to be lived for God. But the distinguishing mark is after you've read, after you've prayed, after you've studied, after you've come to church, after you've gone to school to study the Bible, the distinguishing mark still is how do you love in daily life? Because all of those things should be pointing towards and determining how you love. If I, if I finish reading my Bible and get up and, and, you know, and I am as nasty as I could be, I'm just wasting my time. If I finish spending 15, 20, 30 minutes before the Lord in prayer and I get up and folk can't even get along with me because I'm so disagreeable, I've wasted my time. If my prayer life, my study life cannot go beyond my prayer closet or my study closet, I've wasted my time. What I study, what I pray about should affect how I live when I walk out the door. And so as we read this today, as I said last week, this was a scripture that has been used a lot in the marriage ceremony. Use it a lot. This was not what was in mind when Paul shared it, although we can use it for the wedding ceremony. He was trying to correct a group of people that were divided, and yet they thought they were divine. Here was a group that thought they had it together and didn't realize it had already fallen apart. Here was a group that thought they were approved by God and did not realize that they were living under discipline because they were disapproved by God. So they were fooled. They fooled themselves. And it's a message for us today is that we need to be honest with ourselves about where we are. And this is not a message for you to feel down and despondent that if this message hits toes, if it, if it, if it causes you to feel a little bit depressed, is because God is saying, look, here's where you are. But that's not where you have to stay. He says, because of the power of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer, you too can change. This is not a sermon, this is not a sermon on willpower. I said this in Bible study the other night. This is not, I'm going to do better and try better. 
because we know we've all done that and we failed. Yours truly included. We've done that and we've failed. God says, where this comes into play is when you say, God, the only way this is going to happen is if you empower me, because this kind of life is not natural. It's not. It's supernatural. This kind of life is not lived by someone that casually says, I'm going to change today. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to make a resolution. I'm going to see things differently. I'm going to have a different perspective. You can have all of those and will walk out that door and fail before you get out the parking lot. Someone will say something that will get under your skin and you will respond in a way that is opposite from Scripture. Then we go, God, I just got out of church. I can't even make it out the parking lot. And I done messed up. And I know I've done that before. And so the deal is, God says, how do I change when I allow the Spirit of God, as I, as I am at that moment of decision, to speak to me in an obedience, regardless of how hard it is, I respond godly. And I'm choosing to love. So he says here, last week we read the first three verses, and then we start at verse 4, where he says... Love is, he starts off, love is patient. Now understand, too, that love is that hinge. This is what I wrote down. Love is that hinge that all the rest of, of, of when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, all the rest of them hinge, I mean, all the rest of them swing on. When we hear what happens when, when the Spirit of God is in control of a life, the results are what we call the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit is, and the very first one is love. The result, th that which is produced when the Spirit of God is in control of your life, when he is the pilot, not the co-pilot, when he is sitting in the decision-making seat of your life, he says that first thing that will show up in your life in increasing measure is love. That's the, that's the fruit on the tree that everything else swings off of. And then he goes on to explain, love is. In the first two, like what he does, he said love is patient and is kind. Depending on your version, it may say long-suffering. But is patient and is kind. And he does two things here. He talks about the passive and the active response of God toward us and thus our response towards others. What do I mean? God's love, and God with us, he said love. When God loved us, his love was patient enough to wait on you and I to see that we needed Christ and that while we were still sinners, he was dying. Patient. That means being tranquil while you wait. Wow. Wow. That wasn't the scene for me. I told you, traffic in me, that is my prayer time. Because me and traffic, it is, it is testing the patience. When it says testing, what we usually mean is you're pushing it, you're in trouble. But no, no, it tests it in that it lets me know where it is and where it isn't. But he says love is patient. Love is tranquil while it waits. Waits on what? On whatever it needs to. It is long-suffering. In other words, it walks alongside of whatever it needs to long enough to see the change that needs to happen. Well, wow. Well, what does that mean? Patience with our, you fill in the blank. Patience with my spouse. Patience with my children. Patience with my friends. Patience with my coworkers, teammates. Patience with my life. That as I am going along, am I tranquil? Am I at peace while I wait? Or is there a turmoil going on inside? And God, if this doesn't, if, 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 if this doesn't change soon, something's going to happen. It ain't going to be good. God, if, 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 if he doesn't, I'm telling you, he's wearing my patience. No, he's not wearing your patience. Your patience is immature. Your patience is not fully developed. My patience is not 
where God is intending it to be. So Paul says love is patient. And it is one of the character traits. It is one of the attributes. It is one of the, one of the traits of God himself as he deals with you and I. Come on. Remember the last time you asked, you prayed for God's mercy because you said something again happened in your life that you said wouldn't. You said, God, please be patient with me. And if the Lord was us, he would go, why? It's only going to happen again tomorrow. And he'll say, I know, because I know everything. But he doesn't. And he responds out of patience. And even if he disciplines us, he is doing it in such a way that he is long suffering or he suffers long. Because sometimes when you are patient with people, it causes you to suffer. And usually when we give up on folk, it's because I'm done suffering. Now, one thing that it does not say, it doesn't say that it's forever suffering. God is patient, but God knows when to end and act. Sometimes we don't, and we depend on him to tell us that. But for you and I, he says, and he's talking again, think about it, to the Corinthian community. This was a community that was so impatient with one another. This was a, a, a community that was at each other's throat. And he starts off and says, love is patient. And that structure of that word, when it says it's patient, it is, a, it, is, it is an active word, means it is always happening. There is never a time when it is not occurring. And so you can say, God, I loved him yesterday. I loved her this morning. And I was patient this morning. I loved them and I was patient yesterday. Do I have to do it again? When the opportunity, the lover of people is a person who is increasingly patient with people. And impatience demonstrates typically self-centeredness. Because I'm tired and you are getting on my nerve and this is inconvenient to me. And what I'm not doing is looking at how it was intended, how I am supposed to come alongside you and build you up, build you in the way that God wants me to. It doesn't mean that every time I'm with you, patience means that I'm just super sweet and nice. Sometimes discipline is done in a very patient way. But the whole goal is to get you to the point where you see what God is wanting to do in your life. And I think about the patience that has been had with me, that I can stand here today and you knowing my past and how I grew up and the obstacles I had to climb, I see the patience of the Lord. So how dare me not turn and give that patience to you? So here's a question for you. When the opportunity to be patient comes, do you choose to show your love for others or do you choose your own way? Patience demonstrates maturity and the desire for people to grow. Patience demonstrates maturity and the desire for people to grow. Second one, love is kind. That is his active. Passive is God is patient. He's waiting. But the second one, God is, he says that, that love is kind. You know what? What I didn't mention, almost forgot this. When we start to see love is, it actually has been said of some, I read this, that where you see the word love, you can insert the name Jesus. And I like that. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. And you can go on down the line. Every one of those descriptors in 1 Corinthians, you could fill in Jesus. And that's exactly who he was. But then in turn, it's what Jesus expects of us. So then can I place my name in there and say, Curtis is patient. Curtis is kind. And now it starts to hit home. Because I'll say, Curtis is patient. And at the end of that, I'll put sometimes. Curtis is kind occasionally. And so what he's saying to us is, can I insert your name in your daily life? Because you can insert Jesus' name in there. And we are calling ourselves followers of Jesus. And God says, 
it's time for us to begin to wake up and to begin to see who he is and that should tell us who we should be so love is kind and that one means to show oneself useful in service to others to show oneself mild or gentle and to show oneself useful in service to others mark 10 45 talks about that where jesus says for the son of man did not come to be served. He said he did not come to be served. He was like, he was not to be served, but to serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then and it says, and to give his life a ransom for many. Look at what he did. He said, the Son of Man came not to be served. And for some of us, we come and we say, I'm here, ready to be served. And we don't say that, but we get upset when people are not serving our needs. And he said, why did you come? And Christ said, I came to serve, not to be served. Why do you come? Why do I come? He says, love is kind. And so it says that, look, we understand that this is filled with strength, not weakness. We've been studying this week in Romans, in Romans chapter 12 that kindness looks to serve instead of paying back evil for evil. We learned that this week where it says, do not pay back evil for evil. Do not retaliate. He said, as God's department to avenge, you are to live well with one another. We are to walk beside, well, 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 how am I to act then? I'm to serve. Even when they're, yes, I am to serve. Because I didn't come to be served. God will make sure you and I are served. But when I show up on the scene as a child of God, I come to serve. You ever go to a to an event and they need help and someone shows up and they are ready for everyone to meet their needs and they do not want to meet one. Tell me if you enjoy being around a person like that. They came to get. That was it. They didn't come to serve. What's in it for me? What you got here for me? But when you meet that person who comes to serve, usually what happens is they get served, and they get served well. And so he says to us, are you kind? When you show up, are you useful or are you hurtful? Love is patient, tranquil while waiting. Love is kind, useful when they show up. Because God's kindness toward us did something. And that something caused you and I to be here today. And then he goes on, so he says, Kindness, kindness demonstrates the character and way of Christ in handling others. How I handle others, it will show where my heart is and how much God has me in the way that I kindly handle others. And then the next eight, and we're not going to go over eight, we're only going to do two more here this morning. And we're going to continue on next week. We're doing two more. So we said love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy and love does not boast. The next eight now talks about what love doesn't do. We saw the first two. He gives us the positive first and says this is what love is. Now he says here's what love is not and helps us in life that when we see it in play, we can just insert, I'm not being loving. That's what we can insert. When we see this in play in our lives, we can say, I'm not being loving in the way that God wants. So first one, he says, love does not envy. Love does not envy. Yeah, and it means exactly what it says. It, it is not jealous, but understand this was the big Corinthian problem. This was people that were caught up in have and have nots. And you see it mentioned throughout the letter. These were people that were being, so those that were being mistreated at the communion ceremony, those that went hungry while others ate, those that got drunk while those got nothing to drink. That was 1 Corinthians 11. When he talked about those who had versus those who had not, 1 Corinthians 6, those who had the resources to take people to court and sue them, and those who just had to take it because they didn't. The whole letter talks about it was a have versus a have not. You don't have the resources, I'm going to take advantage of that. You have the resources, I hate you. 
and that continues on even today in the church. And God has resourced people differently. And we get upset because either I'm resourced like him or I don't have the gift that he has or, or, or I don't have that that she has or I wish I had the home that he has and boy, I could really use the car that she has. And we spend our lives in envy, not even realizing, God, why did you bless them and didn't bless me? Why did you give them that and I didn't get it, Lord? And God is saying, you're, you're looking in the wrong place. Come on, we used to say this with our kids. Whenever we bless one, the other goes, well, what about me? And we always say, you act like that was my last gift when I gave it to them. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. But I was giving it to them because I knew that they needed it. And for God with us, he says, look, stop being, stop being so busy looking at what I'm handing you or I'm sorry, handing others, and look at what I've done for you. Well, God, you haven't done much, really? Can we say that? But, you know, sometimes we really act like that. Our attitudes act like that. You really haven't done much for me, God, you know. Lately, you haven't done much. We wouldn't dare say that, but, boy, our attitudes are like, come on, God, you know, you need to help me out. And he's telling us, stop looking at what I'm doing here and look at what I've already done here. He said, love does not envy. He was telling the, the, the Corinthian community, stop sizing everyone up. Stop being jealous for what they have or don't have. Stop wishing you had what someone else did and look at who God is in his fullness and that he will provide everything you need when you need it. Wow, so he says to us, don't do that. That's not love. When I see that happening, Understand, I'm not operating in love. When envy starts to creep up, God, I wish I had, ooh, yeah, wow, Lord, not loving. Right, right. Stop yourself and just go, God, help me. But then he says, and it loves not envy nor boasts. Love is not envy nor boasts. What do you mean it doesn't boast? It doesn't speak exaggeratedly of itself. It doesn't speak in an exaggerated fashion. It doesn't puff itself up. It doesn't have to hear itself sound good. Some of us talk because we feel so horrible about ourselves that if I keep saying how great I am, I might believe it. And so he says to us, understand that that boasting, that it is, it is this exaggerated view of life that you talk about yourself of. I'm so, and you fill in the blank. I'm so, man, I'm so great. Man, wow. Y'all know you need me here. What? But boy, that is that, that, is that boastful attitude to talk about, I'm here now, I can get started. God says, you can't boast and be loving at the same time. Because one is a focus on yourself. Be careful because self-centeredness, boy, leads down to dangerous paths. And, and the other one is focused on God and others. He says, don't think too highly of it. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Which means there is a way I should think about myself. This is not some, some sort of sadistic way to think that I put myself down and the more negative I am about myself, the more holy I am. That's not what God's talking about at all. When he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you are, he says, listen, there is a way to think about yourself, and it is in light of who God is, what he's done for you, and in light of the fact that your brother and sister are standing beside you. And so you do care for yourself, care for your body, care for your needs, but he says, we get into trouble when we, when we start thinking the sun revolves around us. The planets are there for me. And if my way isn't had, I'm turned sideways giving people the side eye, looking evil, angry, and mad because I wasn't handled well. You know, most of the times when I got angry, most of the times it was because I felt someone didn't handle me right. And then I have to ask myself, well, what about me did they need to handle right? Well, I mean, I, 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 help me understand. What is it that now there is a way for propriety and decency, and we'll see that next week as we look about not being arrogant and not being rude. When he talks about that, not being arrogant and not being rude, love is not. 
But when we talk about boasting, there's that person that stands there and just says, I'm it. Or I'm the one whose needs need to be met. And so when we look at those two, as we close today, those two, as we look at those two, here are the questions we ask for envy. Do I serve despite my desires being met? Because envy will short-circuit service because I don't have it and thus no one else is going to have it. Not from me, at least. The person who loves learns contentment in where they are while looking to serve others in the body of Christ and beyond. It says, the lover learns contentment where they are while looking to serve others in the body. God, I thank you for what I have. Period. Because I know you have my best in mind. Now help me to serve others to get, even if what I help them get is greater than what I have. And then the other one for boasting. When it says love does not boast, question for you on that one. How are you singing your own praise to elevate yourself above another? Where and how are you singing your own praise to elevate yourself above another? Because that's where it actually makes you feel better. And how are insecurities playing a part in the pedestal you've created for yourself? The lover does not need to place himself above others, but learns to consider others above himself. The lover does not need to place himself above others, but considers others above themselves, knowing that they are secure in who God had made them. Can I, can, can I take you back to John 13 as we close this? And he says, look, Jesus, let me just read it. Go. I don't have it here. Let me read it from John chapter 13. I always go back to this. This is, this is a reminder to me, and I love it. From verse 3, as we, well, <clears throat> let me read the whole thing from verse 1, John chapter 13. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Verse 3, pay attention. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel tied around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When did Jesus begin to serve in a way that blew everyone's mind? is when he had understood and he had already, it was the knowing that led to the serving. Jesus, knowing that he had come from God, his security was tight. I am of God. I am, and for us, we are born of God. I am secure. And he says that he had come from the, he, he had come from the Father and was going back to the Father. And so his life was wrapped and surrounded in God, his Father. You and I can't serve if we are insecure about what we have, who we are in Christ, what we have, and where we're going. We can't because we are always insecure about one of those three and are always looking for how we can secure it for ourselves. And God says, I've got you, now serve. So Jesus, knowing that he was fully secure, got up and did the unimaginable. We can't pick up a broom because we think it's beneath us. God is beneath me. Do you know how shocked they were for a rabbi to get up and do what he did? First of all, to disrobe, except that which was wrapped around him here. And then he wraps a towel around him and he does what the servants of the house would do, but because there were no servants in the room, Jesus knew that, when they secured the room, he knew that none of them would stoop to wash their feet. Why? They were too busy saying who was the greatest. 
They couldn't see it. And so he says, I got this. Why? Because I'm secure. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to make a name for myself. I am that name. He goes, I have a name. I'm not trying to secure my name. And for you and I, he says, stop trying to secure your name. God says, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Where else do you need it? And he says to you and I, now that you're secure, serve. Who do I serve? One another. How do I serve? In love. When do I serve? Anytime you get. And here's the deal with that. When we do, we will see the love of God flowing from us and people responding to that love, wanting to know him better. Some of us are, are the obstacle to the gospel in people's life because they see us and go, Jesus looks good, but boy, I can't live with one of his followers. And so my question is, are we loving on a daily basis? Are we loving through our patience? Is our love being shown through our kindness? Is it being shown through our lack of envy and our lack, envy and our lack of boasting? Next week, we're going to look at the next ones and to continue to see what love does and who love is. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you, oh God, you talk to us. You show us about what love is, what love does, how love acts. Lord, we see it in the life of Christ. We saw it as we read scripture and we saw how he lived. He lived a life of pure love. And Father, that was so that we could have the perfect standard. And so as we live imperfectly, Lord, we still have the standard before us. You, Lord. I pray, God, that we would be people of love and we practice it in our homes. We practice it as we gather together. We practice it on our jobs. Lord, it is hard for us. It is not natural. It is supernatural. And I pray that we would, we would allow you by your spirit to enable us that when we choose to love, we know we are getting your backing. I pray, God, that we would not forget that, that we would do that, Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. This morning, as we continue to pray, I want to ask briefly, because our, our time is up, our time is out. I really want us to hear this. Some of you, you go, boy, that sounds impossible. I will never be able to live like that. And you know what? You're right. If you are just depending on you, you won't do that. I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail before you hit the parking lot. But if you would allow God to change you, if you would allow him to come into your life and be your Lord, and if you've already done that, you allow him to empower you, you will realize when you choose to do what's loving, you will, you will sense the enabling and you will say, I never thought I could do that. And the response is, you couldn't. God is doing it through you. We all want to change, but do we want to become more like Christ when we change? We all want something different, but do we want to look like Jesus in the process? He's calling you. Let me ask this morning, there's some of you that are saying, wow, that is not my life, but I would love it to be. And you would love to make a decision this morning for Christ, that you will let him, that you will let him take the reins of your life and you will follow him as a disciple, as a student of the Lord. God, forgive me of my sins. I realize that I am a sinner and that I only can change if you do it. If that is you this morning, I'm asking you just to raise your hand and then come and join me this morning. Not going to take a lot of time. If that's you this morning, I want to give that opportunity, always. I do also want to say that if that's you, but coming up here, boy, that's really tough for you, I'm going to ask that you grab one of us after service, myself, one of the elders, um, somebody here, or even the person maybe that brought you, and you ask them, you talk to them about this relationship with Christ. It doesn't have to come up here to, for that to happen but it's encouraging for us to encourage you in that process. Anyone this morning? But then next, part of that loving is loving in a community. God did not cause us to love in the mirror. That's loving yourself. When you're standing in the mirror, God is saying that you're loving other people. You're lo loving under other individuals. I know it's easy to love your dog and your cat, but God says, I've called you to love people. 
And he says, in your loving of people, you need to be in a community that helps you do that. If you do not have a church home, we would love to be that home for you this morning. We would love for you to join us so we can help you love. And if that's you this morning, I'm asking you just to raise your hand and to come and join me. Here, you want to join hands with Solid Word so you can continue to love in a community. 